sounds could be unpredictable. Gee, I'm glad you're recording this. I want to hear it right now. The, the music of my people is what? It's a, it's a, uh, it has to do with the, what? Now, what is that? Now, that's a strange question. You know, I was afraid you were going to do this, get me out here on this uh, tape and uh, expose me to my own ignorance or something. You see, my people. Now, which of my people? I mean, uh, you know, I'm in uh, several groups, you know. I'm, uh, I'm in, let's see, I'm in the group of the piano players. I'm in the group of the listeners. I'm in the groups of people who have general appreciation of music. I'm in the group of those who aspire to be dilettantes. I'm in the group of those who attempt to produce something fit for the plateau. I'm in the group of what? Uh, oh, yeah, those who appreciate Beaujolais. <laughs> And um, then, of course, I'm in the... Um, of course, I've had such a strong influence by the music of the people. The people. That's the better word. The people rather than my people. Because the people are my people. I think he was a great con. One of the great cons of all time. But that doesn't make one bad to be a confidence person. I think... Um, <laughs> Many of our great prophets wanted to get our confidence. And uh, he was a man who needed confidence. He needed your confidence. He needed the confidence of each man in his orchestra in order for it to be the kind of unit that it was. Because remember, this was a man who had trained his orchestra to play arrangements without ever looking at the book. And they'd memorized their arrangements. It was. Perhaps one of the greatest lessons of communication that I ever had in my life by being with the Ellington aggregation. Also, in my mind's eye, was truly a very godly human being. I mean, not so much as a man who followed a design of organized religion, but he was godly in his heart. Uh, you know, he did write uh, some great things, and of course, um, he was very heavily involved in the sacred musics, you know, in the latter years of his life.
Clinton's music was different both in its time and it's still different today in perspective because uh, it had his own personality stamped on it because it combined all the important elements of jazz, melodic, harmonic, rhythmic, and improvisational. And I think it had the best mix of composition and improvisation that anybody was able to achieve. And uh, that was part of the genius. Plus, he had a marvelous feeling for melody and a wonderful feeling for harmony. Uh, it, it all went together. Uh, many other people had done the same thing, but uh, with less degree of success. And Duke just came up with some magnificent works, orchestral works. And I think the most important thing about his music was not the fact that he wrote a lot of hit songs like Solitude or Sophisticated Lady or uh, Satin Doll, which is one of the lesser ones to me, but that he wrote so many great instrumental works for the orchestra. If nobody had ever written a single lyric to anything that Duke Ellington ever wrote, he would still be remembered as a great composer. It doesn't matter that he was a great songwriter, too. That was secondary. He always was ahead. He always kept, he didn't go backwards. He went forward all the time in writing. His music stayed ahead all the time. solid when I could hear an Ellington too. When I could see Ellington up on a podium and that those white tie and tails, I felt like I could do the same thing, you know. It was a, it was a wonderful symbol. When you worked with him, you felt good and so did the musicians, even if they remember perhaps having had arguments with him, you know, but in they left him, but they always came back because once you worked with Duke, you are never the same after that. When I got on the stage, in the concert hall or wherever it was, when I started blowing the horn and playing the music, everything was right with the world. Whether I was hungry, sick, broke, or hadn't seen my family in six months or whatever, it was all right as long as I started playing that music. Duke Ellington uh, is a master in his own right and certainly deserved as much, if not more, attention. Than, than George Gershwin, and I'm afraid that he wasn't given that attention. I think that in due time, uh, the world is going to uh, find out way down the line what a great, great musician this man really and truly was. And uh, my hat's off to you, Duke, for the rest of my life and, and for the rest of eternity. <laughs>
great program. There are many recordings available, including this double CD set called Bragging in Brass on the Sony label. It has about 30 diverse titles, mostly written by Ellington, although unusually it doesn't include his trademark, Mood Indigo. Also, there's a re-release called And His Mother Called Him Bill, which is actually a tribute to Ellington's co-composer Billy Strayhorn, who died not long before Ellington first toured Australia in 1970. It includes the beautiful Strayhorn piano solo called Lotus Blossom we saw performed tonight, and it's available on the Bluebird label. Next week, our final masterpiece for this series, before we take a break for six weeks. Refreshingly, it's about an Australian, the unusual and highly acclaimed Australian writer, Gerald Murnane. It's called Words and Silk, words for his love of writing and silk for his obsession with that great Australian pastime, horse racing. When I was 13, I began to draw sets of racing colours, searching for the colours that would be my own colours. I went on drawing them for 30 years. I've kept about a thousand of the sets of colours that I drew during those years, but I've probably lost twice that many. From the age of 13 to the age of 43, I changed my colours every few days, sometimes every few hours. Join us next week for Words and Silk, a study of the eccentric writer Gerald Murnane. Tuesday, Strindberg is questioning the political purpose of his work. Som kan borde skriva om den nya människans födelse, nya samhällets födelse. His obsession with his work frustrates those around him. Ja, du lovade faktiskt mig att du skulle skriva en pjäs åt mig med en stor kvinnroll i. En roll som jag kunde få mitt genombrott i. Det lovade du faktiskt. Det var dina löften. And their joy at theatrical success is mixed with the pain of choosing between exile and trial for blasphemy. August Strindberg, A Life, 9.30 Tuesday on SBS. On Thursday, life on the farm is easy until Elena's ex-husband turns up wreaking havoc amongst the clan. Frank, è a letto con quell'imbecille. Sono disperato. E i disperati come me fanno soltanto cose disperate. Vai, vai! Country Bumbling with Liv Ullman and Catherine Deneuve in Let's Hope It's a Girl, 8.30, Thursday.